minutes at the end of the session dedicated to our questions. And without any further ado, um, I'm giving the floor to you. Uh, hi everyone. Is the mic working? That's only for the streamers, okay. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I already got introduced. Um, it's my first time at DevConf. Um, the venue is very nice, I must say, and uh, I must say, and um, thank for you for attending the talk. Um, I have, I think it's about 28 slides, which is probably a lot, but, and I'm gonna go through them rather quickly, um, but if there's anything that I was, yeah. I have trouble hearing. I'll, I'll speak louder. It's, yeah, the microphone is for the streamers on like YouTube. Um, I'll speak louder, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have I've 28 slides. Um, I'm going to try and go through them rather, fa rather quickly because I want to leave time for questions at the end. So if anything I said was really unclear or people were unsure about, feel free. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take as many questions as possible. Um, okay, let me just get my pointer on this. Oh yeah, so... I was already introduced. I'm Eric Curtin. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on, in the automotive org on all kinds of different things, I guess. Um, so the scope of this talk, um, the scope of optimization can be quite large, but for this talk, um, we're going to focus on optimization techniques from Linux kernel and init, and init RD boot onwards. Um, so for example, what's something that isn't covered is anything before that, because firmware, et cetera, it's generally owned by the automotive board vendor. Um, so the optimization of this area is out of the, ha out of the hands of an OS vendor um, such as us. Um, and obviously the firmware optimization is just as important. It's just something that's not my responsibility. Um, so, we do, I do not go through optimization of the camera stack at the kernel level either because uh, we use the USB camera for this and rather than an actual ISP SOC um, from a real automotive board. Although the same optimizations here would apply to an actual automotive board. Um, another thing I want to cover is there is a kind of a balance between keeping o an OS generic and making it optimized to run some specific um, things early. So like you could trim down a kernel and user space to only display camera frames and do nothing else, but it, it wouldn't be a very useful automotive OS then. So, um, so yeah, I, I kind of split the talk in two. One is just generically starting an early boot system D service. And then the second half, I'll describe how we applied that to a camera application. Um, and yeah, and some of these, the techniques in this talk can be used to start other s services early. Um, in automotive in particular, there's an expectation to start all sorts of services kind of early. Um, a rear view camera is just one of these. Um, uh, so here I, <laughs> I did a little ASCII diagram of uh, how kind of a Linux OS is booted from a certain perspective. So generally the firmware loads into some sort of bootloader and normally that's where the compression of the kernel and init RAM disk occurs, even though that's not always the case, but normally. Um, and then the first file system mounted is the init RAM FS and that loads system D and does a bunch of things. And then at some point we changed the root file system from the init RAM FS to the, to the normal um, root file system. Um, so so you have you've two options at this point. If, if your system D service, um, if it doesn't need to be start super fast, like it needs to start after three or four or five seconds, maybe starting in the root FS is just fine. But if you want to start something super early, like in the case of a camera, um, you have to um, start it 
uh, within the inner MFS, sometimes called in at RD as well. They mean the same thing pretty much. Um, so the reason why there's, there's two options at this point is there's actually kind of a trade-off here. So when you start a service in the init RAM FS, if that requires you to add more binaries, libraries, et cetera, into the init RAM FS, it actually has a negative effect on the overall boot time because, um, but anyway, I'll go through that in a while. But um, we're going to use that technique for the, this talk because in the case of camera, you have to kind of start it super fast. These are some generic tips just to boot things quickly. They're probably obvious, but sometimes they aren't. So keep your kernel as small as possible um, and as modularized as possible. So anything that can be a kernel module probably should be. Um, and keep the inner RAM FS small. Um, but the kernel in inner RAM FS must be small, as I said earlier, because you actually pay a penalty for every single byte, because every single byte has to be decompressed before you can use it. So they're just um, generic tips. Um, so if you want to start some, a service really early um, under a system D based operating system like all the Red Hat operating systems, um, this, is, this is what it looks like. Um, the one line that's probably important is that default dependencies equals no because system D services have a default set of dependencies and if and the default for that is yes and if you have that set as yes your system D service won't start until a couple of seconds because it must start all the default dependencies first so in this case we don't want that um, this is just a, a Draco file used to pack things into and in a RAM disk, and that's just, it just says, put this file in this sim link in the in RAM disk. And if you do that and run a service like this, it'll actually start within about half a second. This is just how you rebuild an in RAM with this. So, so that technique is useful. Yeah, it's useful to know because if you can, using systemd and using that technique I just described, you can start things within half a second. So. It, if you need to start something within that time frame, that's, that's a good technique to use. Now we're going to apply some of this to a camera application. Um, so this has already been done in automotive in different ways, actually. But the, the existing approaches, they use firmware-based um, cameras and displays to launch and display a rear view camera. And th this works perfectly fine. Um, but it's difficult to maintain. It's, um, it's hardware-specific hardware specific and it's not software defined so it can be difficult to develop for and in fact it's not even Linux um, so it's, you know it's just custom code um, so this was my first um, technique I I tried to start uh, a camera quickly it was something that exists already in rel for edge called kiosk mode which is a mode to to start an auto start a, a graphical application. And I won't play that video, but basically, if, if I played that, that was bef when I started. Uh, the camera would start after 14 seconds, which is clearly too slow. So we have to do something a bit more custom. Um, so then I moved on to an optimized approach. So I was kind of discussing it with the team, and the fir first thing that came to mind is, what's the first graphic that Linux displays? And of course, it's the boot splash, um, which is Plymouth. Plymouth is the tool that launches the boot splash. Um, so the technique I use for this, it's actually, it takes a lot of influence from Plymouth, except the main difference is, um, in this case, not only are you just displaying graphical data, but you're also processing um, graphical input from a camera. I suppose that's, that's kind of the key difference between this and Plymouth. Um, so there's two main components to this. One is libdrm, um, which is part of Meza, and the other one is libcamera, which powers the camera. Um, yeah, so I've gone through that already. So this is libcamera. Um, 
The kernel guys that are involved at the kernel camera stack are, are pushing this library hard. Um, it runs on Chrome OS and all, all the various Linux distributions. Um, I think it even supports Android. But don't quote me on that. It's, <laughs> it's definitely running on, on Chrome OS and all the other distributions. Um, there, it aims to be the Meza of the camera stack. So if, if you're familiar with Meza, Meza is basically the Linux user space graphics stack. Um, so it supports various different types of cameras across multiple CPUs, SOCs, ISPs, etc. Um, and it has decent support for things like DRM KMS, PiPAR, QT, SDL, and yeah, it's basically the compatibility layer for all these, these things. Um, so I wrote a little reference application uh, where I tie all these things together to make it work. I, I called it twin, twin cam. Um, so I, as I said, it's, it's very similar to a boot splash, what we do here. Um, it doesn't use a compositor or a window manager. Um, instead, we use the DRM KMS subsystem to write to the display buffers directly. And you definitely should not do this <laughs> most of the time. Um, like you should run your graphical application on top of Wayland and all that. Um, it's just for this use case, Wayland has so many dependencies, you, you could never start a graphical application under Wayland at the moment at least in around a second or two. It's, it's just really hard. Um, so in this case, there's a lot of custom code against DRM KMS to do it quickly. Um, so yeah, Plymouth is another example of a tool that does things this way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not recommended at all <laughs> unless, unless, unless you need um, performance and need to start something quickly. Um, so this is how you normally install a camera application on a, on a Linux system. So the init or the init RAM FS normally init initially loads all, all of these things. And the camera application is typically stored in the root FS somewhere else. Um, and that's what you should do if you don't have the requirements to stack things really quickly. Um, so to start the camera quickly, we basically moved anything that the camera requires into the init RAM FS. And yet then we wrote a little system, the unit file that looks a little like this. It's very similar to the last example I showed you. Um, I won't go through every single line, but another important line there is the ignore on isolate equals true. Um, because other system D units can can run in this isolate mode, but basically what that means is it can stop other systemd services and, and we don't want that to happen. Um, but yeah, the, not everything in this file is strictly required, but they're the important ones anyway, those default dependencies equals no and ignore and isolate equals true. And here is just, just the drug Dracode module that setup file to add things to the um, inner RAM FS. So the first function says make sure you have twin cam in the inner RAM FS. This depends call, I, it just tells the inner RAM FS that we have a requirement on, the, on this graphics stack. So make sure that's there. Um, Instamods driver media, that's like. Um, that's the media subsystem in the Linux kernel. It's like um, where the camera kernel stuff is. Um, so if you add that, you have kernel support in your inner RAMFS. And the final install is basically the twin cam binary, um, lib camera libraries, lib event library, and the C++ library. Um, I skipped the slide. Um, so when you do all this, um, yeah, you can basically start the camera within two seconds rather than 14, which is the point where I started. Um, so I'll play, I'll play <laughs> a little demo of that I have recorded just, um, just to prove that I'm not talking nonsense. Um, <laughs>
So what I tend to do is I, t I'm a, sorry, I have another on screen. Sorry, I had it on the wrong screen. Um, so this is Grow Bootloader. Um, I normally pause it at Grow Bootloader because this is an old, dusty Acer laptop I have at my house, and I'm not interested in, in optimizing Acer laptop firmware uh, so <laughs> because it's for an automotive use case, not for a laptop. Uh, so I'll hit enter here on the keyboard, and you'll see the camera displayed really, really quickly. Um, and there is me cycling a bike. <laughs> um, so, um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, so if you take the timings there, um, that starts at about 1.8 seconds from kernel boot. And actually, what's more important, because often in the automotive use case, the, sometimes the node processing camera frames is different to the display. Um, so what's more important, if you actually check the timings, we start receiving camera frames at about 1.4 seconds, which is pretty decent. Um, and that, this concludes the talk, but just some shameless <laughs> self-promotion here. If, if you're interested in automotive or arm enablement or any of this space, I'm doing another talk tomorrow on Fedora Asahi Remix, um, which is essentially Fedora and Apple Silicon. Um, and the reason I'm involved in this is because ARM enablement, it's important for automotive because almost all um, automotive boards are ARM based. Um, so it, it provides me and many others in the community uh, an affordable, well upstreamed and powerful hardware to develop on and iterate quickly. Um, so that's about it, thanks very much. Um, I'll take any questions if there are any. This is this is a good question that um, we have. Thanks. Uh, the question is, uh, do I do I just keep on playing the frames indefinitely, or at some point, do we like transition to Wayland? Um, this is something we have to work out. It's it, it's a good question. I've I've spoke to the we have an internal team that works on digital cockpit and that kind of thing. Um, at some point, you should. Um, switch to Wayland and a long-term compos compositor. Um, I just didn't cover that for the scope of this talk. But yeah, 100%, you don't want to be running, writing frames directly to the frame buffer like that in the, in the long term. It's, it's just to achieve the goal of initially seeing it really quickly, because that's a requirement. Yeah. Okay. yeah, go for it. Um, so the question is, did, it, did, I only do the, did I only measure the times on an Intel laptop or, or did I also run this on some ARM hardware that is more similar to what you see in, in automotive? So the answer is yes. Um, at the start, all I had available to me was a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> and um, yeah, the Raspberry Pi was much slower, as you'd expect. But there's a huge difference between a Raspberry Pi and an automotive board because <laughs> the ra Raspberry Pi costs um, 100, 100 euro and an automotive board is like in the thousands. So going back to my last slide on the Apple Silicon thing, I've also ran 
the same thing using my Mac Mini, and I achieve roughly the same time. So it's 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 roughly similar. And actually, most automotive boards there isn't Apple Silicon running on any uh, vehicles at the moment, at least. Um, but an M1 is roughly similar in performance to what you would see in an actual automotive board. Um, but um, I don't want to dismiss that point too much because the hardware is impo important. Like, everything is important. Is the hardware fast? Is the storage fast? Is the camera stack fast? Is the, everything matters. Is the firmware fast? Is the, everything is important, of course, yeah. I have, um, so, the, so the question is, I, I referenced the init RD, which is compressed, um, and have I tried other techniques such as um, not compressing the init, init RD or, or maybe using a different compression algorithm? Um, I did play around with that stuff, and, and I also tried not using an init RAM disk at all, which is another option. Um, but it didn't make much of a difference because I found the blocker was, for that laptop in particular, and other machines I tried, the blocker was generally um, the kernel um, spinning up its camera framework. That was normally the slowest part. Um, those, when I tried those different techniques, I, I got pretty much the same time. Um, so, so, so I didn't see the, the need to just change things for the sake of it. Um, like earlier on in the talk, I referenced you can actually start a systemd service as quickly as half a second, you know. So it's not actually a huge issue. Um, and another question at the back. So the question is, have I also tried this with um, encryption turned on and, th and things like DM Verity um, switched on? I, I haven't, but we have to look at that at some time. I will say on DM Verity in particular, um, I work on Red Hat's automotive operating system. For DM Verity in particular, I'm not actually sure we're going to actually use that for our verification. Um, there's something called ComposeFS that um, Alexander on our team, Alexander Larson on our team is working on. And I think, don't quote me on this because it could be wrong, I think he's using FS verity instead. Um, but yeah, no, we, you definitely have to rerun things with encryption and all these chain of trust things turn on because turned on because it will have an impact yeah yeah Are there? Uh, I really enjoyed this talk and it's nice engineering tasks yeah. to yeah. accomplish this I really enjoyed it uh, uh, at the same time I wonder yeah. uh, like why why uh, I'm thinking about the car uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the the question for everyone in the, online is, this is a really cool technique, but may the question is kind of like maybe we could cheat a little and start to boot when someone opens the door and this kind of thing, and and you, you might not need this at all, and that's a very good point. Um, why this is still important um, is. Automotive companies definitely look into those things, like optimistically starting a car if you think it's, somebody's going to start driving it soon. So first, to first answer the question, they look into that also. 
Um, the second part of the question is, it's actually a certification requirement um, to start it really quickly from cold boot. So cheating only gets you so far. Um, you mightn't pass all the certification requirements. Um, and, oh, and the third reason, if you just auto start a graphical application like this out of the box, using Wayland and all this stuff, it's around 14, 15 seconds. So 14, 15 seconds is just way too slow. You, you definitely, you can do all the cheating you want in the world, but 15 seconds is, is way too slow. Um, question from? Absolutely. Actually, a follow-on to that point is what some automotive companies have looked into is just kind of resuming from suspend and a hibernate state, but that has a couple of issues. For example, if it's suspend and you leave it in a low-power state, you're draining battery. But if it's more hibernate and you're loading from disk, there are still issues because do you want... Would you, rather, would you feel safer in a car that clean-booted from scratch? or a car that woke up from a suspended state. A, a clean boot is arguably safer, but you could debate about those things all day. Um. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not actually against that technique, but some people don't like it because it's not a clean boot, and they would say, is that system safe after suspending all that hardware? and reactivating it. I don't know. I'm, I'm not very opinionated on that stuff. A question here. Um, yeah, yeah. That was a long question, but, but to repeat on the microphone, it was basically, do you need to start quickly in every case? Um, my shorter answer is you kind of do, because it's, it's, actually, it's actually a requirement for some certifications and such, and if you fail the test, yeah. <laughs> You failed the test, so um, they, they will literally, you know, a tester will come in and he'll step into the car, turn on the ignition, start a timer on his watch if he deems it to be sufficient pass or fail. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I'm just going to check the matrix uh, really quickly, and if there's no questions there... Cool. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks for attending. Um, that's it. <laughs>